Hello, I'm Andy Trevelyan and I do epilepsy research. In September 2013, together with my colleagues Jenny Reed, Roger Whitaker, Pato Yazdani and also Clifford Challenger from the charity Epilepsy Action, we made a presentation at the British Science Festival. One of the themes of the festival was the science of waves, so we decided to look at brain waves. Our presentation was titled Tsunamis in the Brain, and this film is an edited version. Our hope is that it will raise awareness about epilepsy and the importance of continued research into this potentially devastating condition, and perhaps inspire people to get involved both in the research itself, but also in raising funds for this research. A seizure is an episode of altered consciousness which arises from intense neuronal discharges in the brain. Indeed, it's fair to say that these are the most intense bursts of activity that ever happen in brains. Modern technology now allows us to visualise such activity, and this is shown in this short film, where you see individual neurons lighting up as they are recruited to the seizure event. Eventually, every neuron in this part of the brain becomes active, which explains why the brain stops working at that time, because normal brain function arises from a far more delicate interplay between neurons. A seizure is a bit like trying to drive a car with your feet pressing both on the accelerator and on the brake. Not good. This is an experimental technique and what we are looking at is a bit of mouse brain tissue. Such studies are giving us fantastic insights into fundamental aspects of seizure biology, but obviously we cannot examine patients in this way. Instead, we use EEG, electroencephalography, which picks up the electrical discharges of neurons. When millions of neurons do the same thing, as happens during a seizure, the signal is large enough to be recorded on the surface of the brain. This was described in our presentation by Roger Whitaker, a consultant neurophysiologist here in Newcastle. As Andy says, I spend a lot of my time recording EEGs, brainwave activity, in patients over at the RBI. And what I want to do today is to attempt something that has never been tried before. I'll repeat that. This has never been tried before. Certainly not in this lecture theatre, and definitely not on a Thursday. <laughs> what we will attempt to do is to record the brainwave activity of one of you in the audience. We're going to attempt to record Kieran's brainwave activity. Uh, <laughs> that's not worry. <laughs> so, a lot of this is squiggles, but it does make sense. This truly is Kieran's brainwave activity. So it's, it doesn't project particularly well, but that's not a flat line. There is actually oscillatory activity in there. And what I'd like to do now, again, this may or may not work, can you just close your eyes for me? Okay. Can I convince you that there's more oscillatory activity up here? Open your eyes again. Can I convince you that that has disappeared? At least one person's got it. I'm convinced. <laughs> Anybody else convinced? Okay. Try it again. Just close your eyes. Yeah? yeah. yeah. That is the alpha rhythm. That truly is brainwave activity recorded live. So, huge round of applause for you. In the next section, Roger describes some clinical cases, illustrating how useful EEGs can be to doctors. This is a real EEG from a patient who was investigated because they were having a, episodes of a horrible taste in the mouth. They would blank out for a bit, they would fumble a bit, and eventually, in some cases, they'd go on into a very obvious seizure. And this patient was in for five days, we call that video telemetry, so we're recording their EEG, we're videoing them for five whole days to try and capture a number of events. Can you see this very, very rhythmical sawtooth activity building up and just going on and on and on and on and on. But what I'd like to also notice, this part of the brain 
looks pretty normal. So actually, it's just the right side of the brain that's having a seizure, whereas the left side is still functioning remarkably normally. This is a 14-year-old who was referred up because she was doing very badly at school. Teachers thought she was daydreaming, wasn't paying attention. Performance in the classroom was going down and down. And can you see this really, really obvious abnormality? If you look very carefully, there's this spike, and if you look in every single lead, it fires off essentially instantaneously. Now, they don't last very long, so here the seizure is finished, usually about five or six seconds. But during that, it's not particularly surprising, the brain effectively shuts down for a couple of seconds. So this is what we would call an absence seizure. This is a 12-year-old boy who was having black spells at school, similar to the previous one, but also was having episodes of collapse. Well, that's a bit more of a worry. So losing consciousness, falling to the floor. Now, there are some spiky bits on the EEG. And actually, this boy does indeed have epilepsy. But in this case, it's not his epilepsy that's causing the collapses. Do you remember on those first tracings, I was showing you the heart rate recording, so the ECG. Each one of these little red spikes is a heartbeat. The EEG is reasonably normal at this stage. But for a 12-year-old boy, this heart rate is getting a little bit slow. And it's getting a little bit slower. And it's get, getting a little bit slower again. And then, that's not good. So the ECG has gone completely flat. The heart has stopped. The EEG, the brainwaves recording, has started to go very, very slow because you need your heart to keep your brain working. He's now making a few jerks. He's completely unconscious, has slumped into the chair. And here, his EEG is completely flat. That's not good. Thankfully, about here, and that's about 18 seconds later, his heart has restarted. His EEG is still completely flat. He's completely unconscious. Now that a little bit of blood is getting back to his brain, the brain has started working again, but very, very slow. He has a couple more jerks as he comes around, which look very, very like an epileptic seizure. So you can see why this was thought to be all epilepsy. Thankfully, his heart rate is coming back up towards normal. His EEG is getting back to normal, pretty much back to normal now, opens his eyes, and says, I feel all right now. And I can tell you, as the patient's heart rate is coming up like that, the technician's heart rate is coming down, <laughs> and back to normal. So, looks very pale, that's the technician. <laughs> so, so this is not a nice thing to happen. Thankfully, it doesn't happen very, very, very often. But this is, a, this is a boy who does have epilepsy, but the point I'm making is that there are other causes of collapse. And even in patients with epilepsy, you cannot assume that all of their events are from their epilepsy directly. And you've got to think of other causes. In this case, this was just the heart stopping. Thankfully, it's never happened again in this boy. And he's doing very, very well. The EEG is a hugely important clinical tool, but it is very difficult to read, partly because of its complexity, but partly because it is only a very indirect reflection of what is actually going on in our heads. To make this point in a rather different but I felt interesting way, I decided to make the EEG even more abstract by turning it into a piece of music. We see here an electrical recording of a seizure and we typically analyse this by separating out the low and the high frequency parts of this trace. I then ascribe the different frequencies to different musical instruments and the power, the blue to red colours in the lower plots, to different notes and wrote a piece of music using some wonderful software called Sibelius. As it plays you will see images of famous people who have or have had epilepsy intersperse with some images from our own research.
I hope you could hear the development of the seizure, but it would be ridiculous to ask Roger to try to make a diagnosis by listening to that. And yet, what we are doing in the clinic is very similar to this, because the EEG is very much an abstraction of what we really want to know, which is how different neuronal populations are interacting with each other to cause the seizure. This information is hidden inside the extreme complexity of the EEG traces, and it is not necessarily easy to fathom what is important from what is not. One particularly important issue is to know where in the brain the seizure is happening. And this turns out not to be so simple to answer because the focus of the pathology is broadcast to other areas of the brain. We realised from our prior animal studies that this could present pitfalls in how the true location of seizures are determined from the EEG. And we conducted research to show how important it is to make the distinction between the seizure core and the surrounding areas, which we termed the penumbra. This work, funded by Epilepsy Research UK and NIH, will have important implications for a range of clinical issues, including surgical approaches to treatment and seizure prediction. We are also conducting other studies of seizure prediction funded by another epilepsy charity, Epilepsy Action, and Clifford Challenger spoke about their work. I was looking at those EEGs of that 14-year-old uh, woman and thinking about what it actually meant for her life. Was she actually getting the support in school that she needed? Was she being able to deal with memory problems? Would she be bullied at school? When she got older, would she be responding to treatment? Would people be saying to her, you shouldn't have a child if you have epilepsy? That still happens. Would she be excluded from certain jobs? She could possibly be excluded from certain jobs. And even if she didn't, she could well be a victim of discrimination as well. We can help in a small way by funding research, but we can also help in, a small, in other ways by providing help, support and information. We publish booklets like these. We have a regular helpline. We have a number of support groups across the country. We want to raise more money, for example, to provide more epilepsy nurses. Epilepsy specialist nurses offer an enormous amount of, of help, but there is simply not enough available. People still die during epileptic seizures. I don't want to frighten you if you have epilepsy or you know somebody with epilepsy. We're not sure of the exact figure. Maybe it's 500 people a year. We're not sure about the exact reason. I'm not talking about somebody having an accident with a seizure, falling under a bus, falling downstairs. That happens as well. People die directly through the effects of epileptic seizures. One of the best ways to prevent that is to make sure people stick to their drugs, they have the best possible treatment and support to do that. And it's a very important thing that we're campaigning on to make sure that fewer people die through their seizures in the, in the coming years. I just want to finish this session uh, briefly um, by talking about what we don't know. And it's a shocking amount, actually, frankly. We know quite a bit now about what a seizure is. At the most basic level of all, we don't even know what starts a seizure, and we don't know what stops a seizure when it happens naturally. We know we, there are some drugs that we can give that almost induce a coma, and, and that stops the, uh, the seizure in status epilepticus. But actually, most uh, seizures stop naturally, and we do not know why that happens. And that's likely to be a hugely important mechanism, that the body has its own mechanism. If we can tap into that, maybe we could uh, stop seizures more efficiently, and we don't know. About 600,000 people in the UK have epilepsy, and about a third of those show no real discernible improvement on any of the medications that we have available to us. That's 200,000 people. That's four times the size of the capacity of St. James's uh, Park. And that's a lot of people in the UK that we cannot help with the med medicines that we have available to us. We need to do more research to find out uh, new medicines. And that likely means, actually, uh, understanding the disease process at a deeper level. 
Some of the people who don't uh, respond to the medicines can respond to uh, surgical treatment. Each year people die from epilepsy, as Clifford's just uh, said, and, uh, uh, and I'm glad he mentioned SUDA. It's important to say that this is rare, and also that if you comply with the medications, if you're taking your drugs, it becomes even more rare. So that's a very important message to get across. In short, there's an awful lot that we need to discover, and for that we need research funds. Now, there are two epilepsy charities in the UK that uh, uh, support research into epilepsy. Clifford's representing one, uh, which is Epilepsy Action, who have uh, helped fund uh, a little bit of our research. And their research is very much focused on uh, at the patient end of the spectrum. But the second uh, uh, charity, which is Epilepsy Research UK, have also fun funded some of my research at a very important level. And they lo uh, look to uh, fund research at a more basic level that also includes animal research and I think quite simply, quite uh, 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 plainly, we will not understand epilepsy without uh, animal research. So the final thing to say though is that for some reason epilepsy is a bit of a Cinderella disease, it's the, the sort of pauper in, in some ways. Uh, it's stigmatized in a way it shouldn't be and people are for whatever reason, don't always stand up and be counted and try to join the fight to try and progress both epilepsy care and epilepsy research. And this is what I would like you to take away uh, uh, from this and, uh, and to join the fight and together we might make some headway. Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed watching our film and that it might inspire you to join us in the fight to cure epilepsy.